Let us all join together in prayer. Let us pray. Father, there are so many thoughts in our hearts which we find difficult to express in words when we come into thy presence. And human language is so inadequate to express our gratitude and our love to thee. Thy goodness and thy mercy have followed us all the days of our life. And we would give thee the praise that belongs to thy holy name for giving us this privilege of coming to read thy word in our own language, of coming to spend an hour at thy feet, listening to thy Holy Spirit's promptings, and seeking to follow more nearly that which we profess to be. We thank thee for thy great love which is so undeserved, the love that has made us what we are, the love that constantly beckons us to a deeper relationship, to a finer understanding of thy ways and thoughts, which are so much higher than our ways and thoughts. Now we pray, O Lord, that thy word may not return unto thee void this morning, but that every single person gathered here may at some point in the Bible study or the worship know that they have met thee face to face that thou hast spoken to them and that they can never be the same again and grant that each one of us may go on our way rejoicing and with the peace that passes all understanding and that keeps our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of thee through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen we have two chapters to study this morning Isaiah chapter 54 and chapter 55 but I'm going to take them one by one so we'll read chapter 54 now and then study it and then we'll read chapter 55 and study that too. Chapter 54 Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in travail. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her that is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Hold not back, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you, like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing wrath for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. For this is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, shall not be removed, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony, and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of agate, your gates of carbuncles, and all your wall of precious stones. All your sons shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the prosperity of your sons. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear and from terror, for it shall not come near you. If anyone stirs up strife, it is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife with you shall fall because of you. Behold, I have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces a weapon 
for its purpose. I have also created the ravager to destroy. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper, and you shall confute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication from me, says the Lord. Now chapters 54 and 55 belong together, and they both follow chapter 53. That all sounds a bit obvious, but let me tell you what I mean. Chapter 53 is about Christ dying for our sins, and everything that follows in the whole of the prophecy of Isaiah depends on this. The rest of this book, chapter 54 to 66, is full of promises. My grandmother used to have one of those promise boxes, a bit like a box of chocolates, and you lift the lid and with a pair of tweezers pull out a little roll of paper. I'm not very keen on them, but she found great help in them, and she would pick one out every day. Now, quite frankly, the rest of Isaiah is a promise box. It's just packed with promises to pick out, but we mustn't pick them out of their chapters, for very often the verse in front and the verse after tells us what the promise really means. So this is our promise box, and we pick them out of here. But it's full of promises, because when Christ died, he became the yea and amen of all God's promises. All the rich truths that we shall now study for the next month or so are dependent on the cross. It's only because he was wounded for our transgressions that all these wonderful things come true. And that's why the first word in chapter 54 is sing, sing. You can only really sing after you're the right side of the cross. And a person can only really sing the praises of God when they know that God laid on Christ their iniquities. And so the chapter flows from chapter 53. Now chapter 54 and 55 are linked. They are addressed to Israel and chapter 54 treats Israel as if she were a deserted woman. But chapter 55 treats Israel as a dissatisfied man. And so all of chapter 54 is addressed to a woman, and all of chapter 55 is addressed to a man. And so the ladies will tend to understand chapter 54 best, and the men will understand chapter 55. But I think we'll all get quite a lot from both. Now chapter 54 then is addressed to a woman who feels that she has been deserted. She has no children, no husband, no home. She once had all three, now she has none of them. And this is a vivid and compelling picture of the city of Jerusalem as it was when Isaiah was saying all this. It's a compelling picture of the ruined capital of the Jews when all the people were away in Babylon as slaves in exile. Jerusalem looked like a woman who had been robbed of her children, her husband, and her lovely home in which to live. And these are the three things for which a woman would live. Now, of course, in our society, there are many other openings and callings for women. But in the Middle East and in those days, there was only one opening, and that was to get married, to have a home, and to look after children. And therefore, the one thing that would make a woman sing, the only things that would make a woman sing would be to have plenty of children, to have a good husband, and to be able to create, create a home for husband and children. And Isaiah the prophet, taking up these three desires, of a woman, and particularly a woman who's been deserted and lost these three things, Isaiah takes these up and says, now these are the three things that God is going to give you back. Take the first. Every woman wants children, and the larger the family, the better. Mind you, I've discovered that for every one that arrives, the target goes down by two. Nevertheless, when we set out in life, we say, I want a nice big family. And this is, of course, every woman's desire. It was the desire of Israel that she might have many children, that she might grow and become a large family in the earth. But here is Jerusalem, deserted, empty, burnt to the ground, and there is no one living there. She is like a woman who's 
been robbed of her children and she's frustrated and unhappy. But God says, sing, O barren woman. You're going to have a great big family and lots and lots of children. So you better start building on some spare bedrooms already. Now, of course, living in tents, you don't build a spare bedroom over the garage. You simply sew another sheet on the end and lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. And indeed, living in tents is very much more adaptable to a growing family than living in houses made of bricks and cement. And so in those days, all they would do would be to add a bit on the tent at the end. And in most picturesque language, which they would clearly understand, he says, now you get a few spare bedrooms on that tent of yours. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, get a bigger tent. Your family is going to increase. And you're going to have lots of children running around. And that's precisely how they got ready for more children. They sewed a bit more on the tent and put in longer cords and bigger stakes. William Carey, of course, made that verse too famous when he started the Baptist Missionary Society so many years ago. And he used this phrase about lengthening cords and strengthening stakes to encourage the church to believe she'd have many more children and to extend her vision to a bigger family that would include people overseas. And so he used these words to the church. But the prophet is speaking to Israel. Now there are two things that a woman likes, not only a big family, but she also wants to see her children grow up and spread and go out into the world and influence it. And many a mother has told me proudly, well, I've got one son, he's uh, teaching physics away up in Leeds University. I have another son, he's a doctor way down in the West Country. And she proudly tells me how the children she brought up have spread out into the world and are now influencing the world and serving the human race. And this comes out in verse 3. Not only is Israel going to have more children after the exile than she had before, the desolate one will have more children than the married one. She is going to see them spread to the right and to the left, or literally from the Middle East to the East and to the West, until they influence nations and possess desolate cities. And one of the things I predicted last Sunday night was that we shall see a continued expansion of God's people. I believe that. For they have been given this task of spreading and influencing and leading the world. One final thing about the first three verses. Notice the word barren. Have you ever studied the word barren in scripture? Some people ask me what are all the chapters about with all the begats in? What possible use is it to us to know that so and so begat so and so and they begat so and so and they all went on begatting all down through the chapter. The interesting thing is that when you get a chapter like that with lots of begats it usually comes to a full stop with the word barren. Study Genesis 11, for example. It's all begats, 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 until you get to Sarah. And just there, the thing stopped. For Sarah was barren, and it looked as if it all came to a full stop. But when things come to a stop, humanly speaking, they've just started, divinely speaking, and Sarah had a child. And then they, that child, Isaac, married Rebecca, and Rebecca was barren. All her sisters had children, but she hadn't. And just when things seemed to stop, God stepped in, and Jacob was born. And Jacob married Rachel. And though Rachel's sisters had children, Rachel was barren. And you notice how God steps in at this word barren and says, that's not the end of the story. Samuel's mother was barren. John the Baptist's mother was barren. Barren, barren, barren. God steps in and the begats start again. And so we have a miraculous intervention here. The woman is Jerusalem. She has no children. And secondly, she has no husband. There was a time when God was her husband. But he left her. He was angry with her. And he deserted her and forsook her. And this happened to the bride, which was the holy city of Jerusalem. And she felt, God, my husband has left me, and, and he'll never come back. I'm, I've not only lost my children, I've lost my husband. And she felt de desolate and forsaken. And so we move to verses 4 to 10, which begin with those wonderful words, fear not. 
Once in a Bible study group out in Aden with the RAF boys, I said to them, go away and study your Bibles this week and find out how many times the Bible tells you not to be afraid. You take the book of Genesis, you take Exodus and so on. I dished them all out, a few books to read. And they went away and they came back and they discovered what others have discovered, that there are 366 occasions in the Bible when you're told to fear not. Did you know that? One for every day of the year and one for leap year for good measure. 366 times we are told in the Bible, don't be afraid. And to this woman who thinks that her life stretches before her, a lonely and desolate experience, God says, don't be afraid. Your husband has not left you permanently. He will come back. God is your husband, the God of the whole earth he is called. And he has only forsaken you for a moment. He is angry with you and he has every right to be. But he's coming back to you. He has not divorced you. That, of course, was said earlier. You remember in chapter 50, Thus says the Lord, Where is your mother's bill of divorce with which I put her away? In other words, I haven't divorced you, but I was angry and I left you for a time. But it's only for a moment. Now the two things that every woman wants in a husband and which she has a right to have are these, love and loyalty. In the Hebrew language, those two things are expressed in only one word, kesed, a lovely word. Unfortunately, we have no English word that covers both meanings. Our English word love is often so debased that it doesn't carry anything of loyalty in it. But the Hebrew word love means loyal love, a love that never lets anybody go. Do you know why we use a ring in marriage? It used to be believed that a nerve ran from that finger up the arm to the human heart and that when you put a ring round that finger you were surrounding the heart nerve with something that has no end. In other words, with a loyal love that would never let someone down for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Of course, there is one thing that breaks that human relationship till death us do part. But God's love isn't like that. He doesn't say till death us do part. God says here, you will forget the shame of your youth, that was their bondage in Egypt, and you will forget the shame of your widowhood, that was their bondage in Babylon. Your husband will come back and love you and have great compassion on you. And there is a contrast in verse 8 between the wrath he had for a moment and the everlasting love that will come back. God may be angry with his people for a time, but it's always temporary. He is not angry with us forever, says the psalmist. His anger is temporary, and his everlasting love will replace it again. And the history of the Jews is the history of God's everlasting love coming back and claiming them for his own. Not only will there be love, there will be loyalty. Whenever you see a rainbow, your thoughts, no doubt, as a Christian, will go back to the Bible and go back to the days of Noah. The rainbow is God's wedding ring with the human race. The rainbow is the ring that God encircled the earth with when he promised to Noah that he would never again destroy the human race in that way. And it's a promise he has kept. It was God's covenant ring his marriage ring around the earth and the human race. And we can rely on that rainbow when we see it. It's true, it's reliable. And God says here to Israel, you remind me of my days with Noah. Just as I promised him I'd never destroy society again in that way, I have promised you that I'll never rebuke you. I will never wipe you out. And the only explanation we can possibly find for the survival of the Jews is, of course, that promise of God, the covenant that he made. I told you last Sunday, I think, that a Russian philosopher called Berdayev and a German philosopher called Hegel both tried to explain history in philosophical terms, and they both reckoned they could explain everything bar one. The only event in history which neither of them could fit in to a deterministic philosophy of history was the survival of the Jews. Neither of them could do it. 
And <clears throat> so we have God's steadfast love in verse 10. The mountains may depart and the hills be removed. That would be a catastrophic disturbance. Even if that happened, God's steadfast love. The word steadfast love there translates only this one Hebrew word, kesed. This one Hebrew word which means a love that never lets someone down, that never lets them go, and that never lets them off. A love that's absolutely loyal. And in these days we need to remind people that true love is loyal. There is only one sort of love in God's sight and it's steadfast love. That whatever happens, whatever the other person does, that love goes on. It's so easy to, to make promises in a wedding service. I shrink in a sense when I hear a starry-eyed couple making such solemn vows, till death us do part. Do you know what that means? And when one hears them say, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, and then you read 1 Corinthians 13, love suffers long and is kind, it vaunts not itself, it is not puffed up, it doesn't behave itself unseemly. That's not sexual love there, it's not human affection that is described there, it's steadfast love of God that is described there. And unless a couple find the steadfast love of God, they won't be able to keep those vows in spirit as well as in letter with that loyalty that comes from the love of God. Well now this deserted woman called Jerusalem, she's lost her children but she's going to have a big family and she's told to get ready for them. She's lost her husband but he's coming back again and he will be loyal to her. He hasn't let her go, he was only angry with her for a time. She's lost her home but she's going to get it back again. Now one of the desires I think of a woman is this, to have a place of beauty and security where she can live. To have a home that is attractive. Oh, how she likes to put up those little curtains and the little ribbons and, and get it tidy and, and furnish it as she would like and choose some material. She wants an attractive home that she has created. And she wants a place that will be a place of security, a place of safety. This is inherent to the feminine nature. And here we have this instinct ascribed to the nation of Israel. She wanted somewhere to live that would be attractive and secure. And God says to Israel, this desolate woman, I'll see that you get it. We'll have Jerusalem rebuilt. And the rebuilt city will be far more beautiful and attractive than anything you ever saw. And all the language here is for a woman. He said, behold, I will set your stones in antimony. Now, I don't know if you know what that is, but antimony was used by the Hebrew women to paint their eyebrows and eyelashes, a dark color. Nothing new under the sun, you see, says Ecclesiastes, and here it is creeping back with the new generation. But they painted there so that their eyes sparkled like jewels much more clearly against the dark background, same reason as today. And God says, taking the feminine makeup of antimony, the stones of Jerusalem, I will set those precious stones in antimony so that they'll glisten and sparkle and people will notice. And he said, I'll build your city with precious stones, sapphires, all the jewels that a lady would like. He mentions, I'll build your city like that. It'll be a beautiful city. Now, of course, this didn't come literally true. It hasn't become literally true yet. Jerusalem was rebuilt, but it was rebuilt of ordinary stone, limestone from the hills of Judea. And some people have said, isn't God going to keep his promise? And the answer is he is. He's not referring to the old Jerusalem, he's referring to a new one. He's not referring to the one they are going to build. What human race, human people could afford to build a city of sapphire? Only God is wealthy enough to do that. And the last book in the Bible describes the city of God, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. A city whose builder and maker is God. Not a city that men build up, but a city which God builds down, as it were. And that city will be made of these stones. God will create it not of limestone, that's much too common a garden for the city of God. He is creating a new Jerusalem for his people to dwell in. And one day we shall live in a most wonderful city. No reason why you shouldn't take those stones literally, is there? God creates precious stones. 
He created them rare down here, but is there any reason why he shouldn't create them by the multitude, by the ton, and build a city of them? And the glory of that city is just wonderful to think of when you read that story of it in Revelation. Not only will this city be the most beautiful and attractive home for his people, it will be absolutely secure. He will, they will enjoy his protection as well as his prosperity. Now this is something that the Jews have already begun to find and which God's people in the church have already begun to find but which will of course be ultimately true when we get to the new Jerusalem. But it's already true now. And the truth is this. If anyone stirs up strife against you, it is not of me and they will fall because of you. It's strange, you know, that people don't learn this lesson, that if you attack the people of God, you fall because of them. No dictator, no nation has got away with an attack on the people of God. And they fall because of those people of God. The Roman Empire had many, many, many years of persecuting the Christians. But the Christians are still here and the Roman Empire has gone. In the last 20 years, we've seen three concerted attacks upon the Jews. And one just wants to read this verse. If anyone stirs up strife, it is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife with you shall fall because of you. Now, why will they fall? The answer is very simple. The God who is their husband and protector, and a husband is essentially a protector, that is why a wife walks on the left arm of the husband, that his right arm might be free to use his sword to protect her, or to use his fist to protect her. And so the wife always is on the arm that he will not use to protect her. And he has his right one free to fight for her. That's why she walks on the left. And God is a husband of Israel, and his right arm is laid bare whenever she's attacked. Now God has made the armaments manufacturer. That's what the next verse states. Don't be afraid of those weapons, says God, because first, I made the man who made them. And second, I made the man who wields them. And if I am your husband to protect you, since I made the man who made the weapon and I made the man who uses it, you have nothing to fear. I can deal with that. I'm tempted to be thoroughly up to date and say that Israelis need not fear the Russian mix in the hands of the Arabs because God made the Russians and God made the Arabs. That's what's being said here. It's very simple, down-to-earth language. I made the blacksmith who blows the fire of the coals to forge the weapon. And I made the ravager who destroys with it. I made these men and I'm your husband. And if I'm their maker, I can deal with them. And that's what is said here. And God sh has shown this right through the centuries. Do you know what was the ultimate weapon of 3,000 years ago? It wasn't the hydrogen bomb then. The ultimate weapon was the chariot. And the chariot, the iron chariot was invincible. And if you didn't have chariots, you didn't stand a chance against them. And Israel had no chariots. And Sisera came against her with chariots. Humanly speaking, Anybody would have said, I know which one will win. They've got far superior weapons and numbers. But God is the God who made Sisera, who made the chariots. And therefore Sisera lost. And I've stood on the top of Mount Tabor, looking down over the plain of Israelon, and listened while a young Jewish man told us how Sisera was defeated down in that valley. A most vivid description, and he told us uh, as if he, he'd, he'd watched it yesterday. Well now, the protection of God is there, and this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me. Jerusalem, when Israel was in Babylon, was like a deserted woman. She'd lost her children, she'd lost her husband, she'd lost her home. But God says, I will give you children far more than you ever had before. I will come back to you as a husband and you'll have my loyal love right to the end. And I will give you a place to live in that will be beautiful and secure. And I will watch over you, my people. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. 
Now that's the chapter for the ladies and we'll read chapter 55 while the board is being turned round. <clears throat> chapter 55 is addressed to the men. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Hearken diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in fatness. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander to the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you know not, and nations that knew you not shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and return not thither, but water the earth, giving seed, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace, the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign which shall not be cut off. And the three things a man is concerned about, his business, his religion, and his garden, and here are the three things mentioned which will appeal to male interest. I begin by painting the background to all this. You know, don't you, that the Jews have a tremendous reputation for money making, for business, for trading, for seizing and exploiting the opportunities. And they rightly deserve that reputation because it is true. And the gifts they have as a nation peculiarly fit them for money making. Where did they start this habit of trading? Where did they learn to be such money makers? They didn't learn it in the promised land for there was no opportunity to do it there. They were not on a trade route in the promised land. It was when they went to Babylon. Babylon, situated as it was, at a strategic point in the then known world, here was the Persian Gulf and the Tigris and the Euphrates. Here was Babylon. And here was the Mediterranean, away over here in the Promised Land. Now, the road from Africa to Asia went through there. The road from Europe to Asia went through there. And Babylon was at the meeting point of East and West. And, of course, there was opportunity to trade. And Babylon was the center of commerce and prosperity. If you wanted to make money, Babylon was the place you went to. And the Jews were taken in exile across the desert to Babylon. And there they began to learn to make money. And they became the traders that we now know. One thinks, for example, of the reputation that Shakespeare gave Sherlock for his pound of flesh. One thinks of the great bankers of Europe, the de Rothschilds, the Fuggers, the origin of the word pettifogging. One thinks of that man I may have mentioned last Sunday night, Nathan Meyer, who on a hill watched the Battle of Waterloo and as soon as he saw, to his surprise, that the French were going to lose, dashed back to Britain by boat, bought consuls on the stock exchange, and when the news came through a day later that the Duke of Wellington had won, he made a cool two million on the deal. That is quite typical. We have Isaac Wolfson, the man who pioneered higher purchase in Great Britain in the 1930s and one of the richest men in England. 
of Gus Great Universal Stores. There are many another. Wherever you go in business, you'll find Jews. Now, this chapter was written to tell the Jews that is not your calling. That is not why God gave you these gifts. They were to be used for something else. Because, in fact, this fails to satisfy. Making money doesn't make a man content, and I've met so many people now who have proved by their lives that this is true. They are left thirsty. They are left hungry. And so they think that it will be satisfied by making even more, by extending the business even further. But this does not satisfy, and it never will. There was a man sent by his doctor down to... Uh, the West Country for a rest. The doctor said, now look, you're going to finish yourself if you go on at this rate in your business. His business was cattle dealing. And he was sent to a little seaside village in Devon and as soon as he got unpacked and came down from his hotel bedroom, he went to the receptionist and he said to the receptionist, do you know anybody around here who's got any cattle for sale? It was a drug. He just couldn't get rid of it. He couldn't leave it for a time. He was unsatisfied still. Now the Jews in Babylon were traders. They became businessmen, money makers, and it left them hollow and unsatisfied. And so the first part of this chapter is an address to those whose interest has become their business. And it's an invitation. You're still thirsty. You're still unsatisfied. You're still not content. In all the money making and trading, you still haven't got that which satisfies why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which doesn't satisfy? Why are you living for something that can never fill the aching void inside your heart? Why do you do it? Come and buy something without money. Here's a, a wonderful proposition. Something free. Something being given away. Now, of course, if you offer something free, people always suspect and say there must be a catch. You don't give away something like that free. You charge for it and you make money on it. And here to these Jews in exile, God says, you come. You're thirsty people. All your trading is not satisfied. You come and drink, not just water, but wine and milk. And don't bring your checkbook, it's free. It's a wonderful invitation to those who are unsatisfied with money. And of course, nowadays, along with the concern for money, goes the concern for slimming. And every magazine and paper tells you how to slim. The Bible says, delight yourselves in fatness. <laughs> and sometimes people say that contentment goes with this. But you see, it's the opposite of what the world wants. The world says, make money and you'll be satisfied and have a slimming diet and you'll be popular. The Bible says, you come and buy without money and without price and delight yourselves in fatness. Really contented, really nourished, really satisfied. There's something that they're being offered here that they can't find in the business world. And this is a word that one just wants to shout aloud today. Now the alternative is this. The business of Israel was not to make money but to lead the nations of the world to God. To be a leader, a commander, a witness to the peoples of the earth. And those gifts which they have demonstrated so wonderfully in making money, those gifts were given by God to lead the nations to God. They're gifts for exploiting an opportunity. They're gifts for seeing the chance. They're gifts for planning ahead. They're gifts for perseverance. They're gifts for being at the right place in the right time. These are the gifts that God gave them to be witnesses. And it's a prostitution of those gifts to turn them all into business and money making. And so God says, if you listen to me and come back to me, I'll put you in a different kind of business. What David was to you, you will be to the world. Now what was David to you? He was your leader. He was your witness to God. He was your commander to the people. And what David was to you, I will promise you I'll make you to the world if those gifts come back to my business. If you'll offer your gifts to me, I'll make you a leader and commander to the peoples. Peoples you never knew will come running to you and say, we want to know you, not because you're a money maker, but because you know God. Because you've got something we haven't. We've come to you not to learn how to succeed in business, but how to know the Lord. 
And the people who knew thee not will run to you because of the Lord your God. You'll be able to help them and tell them. It's the tragedy of history that Israel used her gifts in commerce rather than to commend the nations. I have the feeling she's beginning to recover her vision, her destiny, and beginning to see in the way Jews are talking today, they are beginning to realize that Israel's role in the world is a spiritual one, a role of leadership, a role of command, a role of witness, and what David was to the nation, the nation is to be to the world. Behold, I made him a witness. Oh, the gifts the Jews have that could be used for witness. He was a leader. The gifts the Jews have to lead, they can lead in almost every other sphere in life. They should be our religious leaders. And the gifts they have to command, we've seen that. Those gifts were meant to command the world spiritually. That then is the business of Israel. We're talking to Israel now as a man. Are you interested in business? Fine, you're in the wrong business, Israel. The real business you should be in is coming and buying without money and without price that which satisfies and then going out to share that with the whole world. Not teaching a world to make money which doesn't satisfy, but teaching a world to love God which does. Now the second thing a man is interested in is of course his religion. Men are religious. They don't usually like church, but they are religious. And so often they develop their own religious societies and ceremonies. And deep down men are religious. And deep down men want a faith by which to live. And deep down men want to know the truth. And deep down men want what God has to offer them. I really believe this. I proved it in the forces. At first I wondered what it would be like to have a congregation entirely male because I'd been used to congregations that were not entirely male as many churches are and there are many men who are very shy of religion but I discovered this that men want religion deep down they want the truth they want to be related to the truth they want to know how you believe in God I wonder if you watched the debate on does God exist last night between some of the leading men of this land well then what is the secret of religion the secret is twofold. First, you'll never get anywhere in religion until you repent. That's the first thing. And that's the hardest thing for a man to do. It's much easier for him to support religion, to patronize it with his money and with his time, than to come and acknowledge that his ways and thoughts are sinful and that he needs to repent and seek the Lord. You will never come to realize that your ways are wrong and that your thoughts are wrong until you measure yourself by the right standard. Now, as long as you measure yourself by someone else, you say, well, my ways are all right, my thoughts are all right. But that's the wrong standard. The standard is God's ways and thoughts, which are that much higher than ours. And when you do, you realize that your ways are wicked and your thoughts unrighteous. God's ways and thoughts are clean and pure and honest and upright and straight and a businessman needs to measure his standards by God's standards not what everybody else does we had a most moving talk from a businessman at our last men's evening group Mr. F. N. Martin and he spoke to us of how to, how to be a Christian in big business the sort of business that most of us never dream of he began by telling us that his bank manager rang up and said look old boy can you reduce your overdraft from two million to one million now this is a world in which I've never moved. But he told us how God helped him in business, big business. But he told us how he had to measure his ways and thoughts by higher ways and thoughts than were practiced around him. That's when a businessman gets religious, when he starts measuring himself by God. And realizes that his ways are wicked and that his thoughts are unrighteous. And that by God's standards, which are so much higher than men's, by God's standards, he will be judged, not men's. When we stand before God, it will not be according to our own ideas or other people's that our lives will be measured, but by God's ways and thoughts. That's when a man begins to repent. When should a man repent? How should a man repent? Why should a man repent? Three reasons. When should a man repent? While the Lord is near. The Lord isn't always near. Sometimes we're so busy getting and spending, laying waste our powers, that, that God seems far away, he's not very near. 
But there come moments, it may be a bereavement, it may be a sudden disaster, it may be the sound of a hymn coming out of a church door. There are moments when God is near. Billy Graham is perfectly right at the end of his sermons to say, you may never have an opportunity like this. God may be nearer to you now than he's ever been before. That may well be true. And suddenly, something confronts a man with God. It may be some danger, some great difficulty, some huge responsibility. He's confronted with God. God is near. He should seek the Lord then. God isn't always near. And when death comes, God departs from a man's life forever. A great gulf is fixed between a man and God at death if he hasn't found him first. Seek the Lord while he may be near. There was a businessman in America who never slept in a bed. He always slept in trains so that he could make money from nine o'clock every morning in the next town. One day he was stricken with polio and years later he told someone, I thank God that I've got polio. It stopped me in my tracks. And he said, now I know God. And he might never have known God if that sudden disaster hadn't hit him and he'd had to stop and seek the Lord while God seemed near. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. God is near now. And he may be found now. That's when the man should seek the Lord. How should he seek him? The answer is by turning away from what he is and turning to God. Let him forsake his evil ways and his unrighteous thoughts. Turn his back on those and turn his face to God and say, God, I'm finished with that. That's repentance. Repentance isn't being sorry. Repentance is what the schoolboy said, being sorry enough to stop. It is something you do, not something you feel. True repentance is saying, I forsake my evil ways and my unrighteous thoughts. I stop it and I turn to God and I seek him. That's how you repent. And thirdly, why should you repent? The answer is that he may have mercy upon you. God's mercy can only come to the penitent. That's why. People who think that God's mercy is for all are mistaken. It is for those who repent. And so let him return to the Lord that he may have mercy on him and that he may abundantly pardon. God's forgiveness just waits for the penitent. But until a man forsakes his evil ways and his unrighteous thoughts and returns to the Lord, God can't forgive him because the condition forgiveness is missing. The other thing that this man needs to know is this. That a true religion is based first on repentance on his side and second on revelation on God's side. He needs to know the truth. Where will he get it? From other men? No. From his own head? No. Where will he get the truth? The answer is that there is a parallel between God's word and the rain and the snow. Like the rain and the snow, God's revelation, God's word, God's speak, spoken thoughts have come down from heaven to earth. Truth starts in heaven and it's given from heaven like the rain and the snow. Second, it comes down and it affects the earth and it changes it. Third, it produces something in the earth. It produces seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Now that's a business proposition and it's in business language. What is a businessman interested in? His returns and what will prosper. He will close down an aspect of his business that has no return and no prosperity in it. And here is the proposition to these business Jews of Babylon. The best business to be in is the word of God. I'm in that business. And it's a most prosperous business. The word of God doesn't return empty. You get good returns from the word of God. Yesterday afternoon I was with Gideon's International. Here are a group of businessmen who've been persuaded to part with thousands of pounds of money and apparently with no return financially. It's a most extraordinary phenomenon. Here are a lot of businessmen pouring their money into what some would say was a business flop. Do you know why they do it? They do it because of this verse, verse 11, which assures them as businessmen that they're putting their money into something good. It assures them that God's word has a return and that it prospers in the thing to which it sent it and that it's the best business to be in. And so thousands of businessmen all over the world are in Gideon's International pouring their money into what doesn't bring them back a halfpenny. But they are putting it into a prosperous business because they believe the word of God prospers and that it doesn't return empty and that it comes back 
with interest and that the investment is worthwhile. And of course they have hundreds of stories to tell them that in prisons, in hotels, in hospitals, and all over the place, the word of God has returned with interest and saved lives forever. And so they pour their money into it. This is true prosperity. And in commercial terms, it's good business to spread the word of God. But a businessman needs first of all to know that true religion is based on repentance on his side and revelation from God's and that the thing he needs to do then is to study the word that's come down from heaven and then to spread it and plant it so that there may be seed for the sower and bread for the eater. It's a good business to be in. And if I felt that there were no returns from preaching the word of God, I'd stop preaching the word of God. It's because I believe that there is a return. And that when I preach, it accomplishes what God means it to accomplish. And it doesn't come back empty. No real sermon on the word of God comes back empty. It changes lives. It plants new thoughts. Seeds are sown in the heart and it gives bread to the eater and it feeds hungry souls. What a wonderful business to be in. That's true religion. Repentance on our side, revelation on God's. And finally, the businessman, when he comes home at the end of the day, is interested in his garden. And all of us have a touch of the gardener in us. You wouldn't think so, I'm afraid, to look at some of our gardens, but we have. And in fact, we were made to be gardeners, not businessmen. We were made to be gardeners. Adam was a gardener. And God who made him sees that every proper gardener's work is done upon his knees. Adam had a garden. And God is going to put us in a garden city one day. Gardening. Study that in the Bible. There's a subject for you. Unfortunately, this Tuesday, we're not able to have Dr. Shuel Cooper. He's coming in September instead of this week. But we shall have a man there who's done nothing but gardening and God, so far as I can find out, with a bit of military life thrown in too. But he's fascinating to listen to on gardening and God. And some of you will have heard him. Now we have man's garden, which is, of course, nature around him. And two things are here said about the garden in which man lives. First, that when he responds to the call of God, he goes out in such joy and peace that the garden sings. I was reading again this week. I meant to bring it into the pulpit, now I've forgotten. John Macefield's Everlasting Mercy. Have you read it? How the, the station brook bubbled out of paradise after it found Christ. How everything in nature spoke to him of God and seemed to be praising God. Or else there's that hymn, earth around is sweeter green, heaven above is softer blue. Something lives in every hue Christless eyes have never seen. And this is true. The hills of the trees of the field break forth before you into singing. When you're right with God, then you appreciate nature. And the office doesn't confine your thoughts. It's wonderful when you find a businessman who loves nature. God's work who is not so interested in his own that he has no time for God's, but who can appreciate God's handiwork and beauty because he's got eyes to see and his garden is a lovely place to be in. The other thing, of course, that's said here is that one day nature herself will be completely renewed. The desert will blossom like the rose. Well, we're already beginning to see a bit of that in the Middle East. But this is really referring to the day when the whole creation which is groaning and traveling, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God, when nature itself will be restored from a wilderness to a garden. Oh, I know the gardener who said, who was told, you know, you have a lovely garden here. Aren't you thankful for God, to God for all he's done in your garden? And the gardener rather naughtily replied, well, you should have seen this place when he had it and attributed it all to himself. And there's an element of truth in that at the moment. But one day God will restore his garden. At the moment he allows us to, but one day he will. And this refers to the day when he will transform nature. And those thorns and thistles which came in with man's curse in Genesis 3 will go out with man's blessing. And when the world in which we live will be a new heaven and a new earth and a new garden, and we'll be interested in God's garden. In that garden we shall be nearer God's heart than anywhere else on earth. Well, here we have a prophecy to Israel addressed first as a deserted woman and second as a dissatisfied man. 
and that's precisely how she was in the exile. But may I finish by saying that I believe these words are also relevant to the new Israel, the Church of Christ, and that the precious promises in these chapters are for you and for me. And I would finish by just quoting one of them again. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. When you do, you will go forth in joy and in peace. And even the trees of the field will be clapping their hands. Amen.